University of KwaZulu-Natal, but also there is an opportunity to involve non-academic partners, and this is uh, along the lines that Christopher, uh, Christopher mentioned about you know, interaction and community development. And on the left-hand side, you can see the key themes underpinning our research and how these themes and overview of informal settlements in South Africa and then focusing with Durban, understanding good available software practices, upgrading models that have been used in the past. Uh, you see all these themes, how they impacted on selecting our three case studies. And I would like to focus specifically on the co-production element because we've been trying to use participatory action research-based uh, methods in order to involve the end users, and by that I mean involve the residents from the three communities that we've been uh, shortlisted as our three case studies, as much as possible by having community researchers working with us as active course researchers since the start of the project in 2016. Uh, training them and involving them, and them also leading and kind of uh, uh, gathering data of for the, the research purpose of the project. And then through this way, we believe that we can have a better evidence base of community-led aspects. And again, our focus is on environmental and construction management systems. But this methodology can be applied in other aspects as well. It cannot be just you know, housing and services. Um, and then, of course, for the communities themselves, this is a way to understand the capacity they already have and building on their existing capabilities and then see how how through these approaches they can get more ownership and control of the upgrading process. And at the end, hopefully, this builds capacity not just for the communities themselves, but also for uh, local authorities and the municipalities that have used traditionally these top-down approaches that have not been uh, very useful to date. I would like to run you quickly through uh, our completed phases. Uh, phase one, which was the kind of uh, propagating uh, phase led by uh, the uh, South African partners, of course, because they have an understanding of the local context, and then they run a comprehensive review of uh, policies, stakeholder analysis, but of course th they are the ones that introduce the community engagement strategy, which is the fundamental uh, aspect of, of this project and how that then uh, led to the identification and selection of case studies. And then we started phase two uh, last November, November 2000, uh, no, to, uh, November 2016, and it lasted for a year and was completed in September, October 2017. And this was a year long phase just to work with communities and introducing the co-production strategies which varied from different tools such as photo voicing, photo mapping, or communi using community events as tools to actually uh, you know, uh, map urban transitions. Uh, and what I mean by urban transitions is first of all understanding buyers and drivers in community self-organization, which of course are not necessarily uh, the same, obviously uh, it's one of the difficulties from a, an academic perspective and a research perspective in running these projects is the fact that you cannot generalize from single case studies. So the, the bars and drivers in Namibia stopped, which was one of our case studies, are not the same as in others. So the, the lessons learned from that were very, very important. And then, of course, moving on, mapping those urban transitions, we had to understand how communities gain access to different structures within the community, but also outside the community at the world and city level, and how they communicate with other institutional, political or non-political actors. And some of these networks, we found out that are invisible and hidden, but these have quite powerful messages, particularly if we were to disseminate these findings to other informal settlements and help them engage into a collaborative community and upgrading process. And once phase two was completed in 2017, and then phase three and four uh, started uh, taking on this methodological background and uh, knowledge from phase two, and then the application is on phase three, particularly on close loop environmental management systems, and phase four is on project management and skills enhancement in construction, focusing specifically on the top structures, meaning uh, the housing. And I would like now very quickly give some messages. Obviously, I don't have the time to go into. Uh, uh, detail, but of the three case studies and some lessons learned or some 
observations about southern ownership uh, <coughs> then. So one of our uh, case studies is Namibia's topate, is now a complete phase one of Namibia's topate is now a completed project <coughs> where the federation of the urban and rural pool, uh, an NGO again under uh, SDI Alliance, uh, led the provision of 96 houses and also enabled the culture of group savings and group financing. So ideally the, the, the lesson learned here is that the fed up houses are larger and of better quality and value compared to what the RDP, which is the government the municipal uh, provision of. And uh, one of the very good things that we've mapped, and obviously had interviews and focus groups with people involved there, was the CMTs, the community contractors and construction management teams, who actually supervised the whole process and led the upgrading, uh, involving local people in the building process, and having transferability of skills, and of course the people who were involved in the building that had the ownership of the process, and they felt that this was their permanent home. Um, but s talking about that, uh, on the kind of uh, lesson learned side of things, is that the neighborhood plan was a bit ignored. So and there was a lot of focus on building the housing and having the feel that this is my own permanent home, but then there were issues about open spaces, and understanding the passages surrounding, um, surrounding the property, to whom they belong, who has access to them. And this led to issues of uh, the elimination of uh, boundaries, safety, privacy. A lot of people started fencing, for example, their, uh, their yards as places to secure that this is their own home. And that, of course, had been, you know, the um, unintended sequences, basically, of, sp like, of lack of spatial integration. And, of course, that is not community cohesion at the end of the day. So it's not, again, just about housing. And this is a good example of showing that it's more about neighborhood planning in general. And the other thing is about passing the knowledge to the youth, because this is an example that happened almost, uh, Claudia, correct me if I'm wrong, seven years ago? Yeah. Yes. And you can see people now that say, oh, this is something that my parents did. Uh, why would I be involved with that? Perhaps if one phase to begins, somebody might train us on, on that. But it's not something that we passed on consistently. Uh, which is something, though, that on the other hand, we see on this case study quite similar to Namibia's to pay Pizan River. Uh, this is actually a quite uh, old project, started from the 70s and it's been through a number of upgrading phases, but one of the most recent ones, again, fed up was involved, and then houses are larger, as I said before, compared to the municipal ones. Uh, and here the group uh, saving culture and the past knowledge to the youth is something that was preserved, and you see that through training, uh, done both formally and informally, uh, to how to train youth, youth groups and people to be involved uh, in uh, the construction side of things, and this obviously has helped them with their own, uh, you know, uh, job opportunities in uh, in the local area. Uh, but the lesson learned here is that they trialed uh, the construction of double-story buildings as a as an answer to densification. Uh, I believe. Uh, but the, the lesson learned here is that actually people do not. Uh, like to live in double story buildings, and it's obviously quite often when we talk about housing and particularly affordable housing, uh, and in this context, in informal settlements of grading, it's about understanding the cultures uh, of different people, accepting customs and cultures is one lesson learned here, and of course, uh, issues with older people, disabilities, and the fact that just people prefer to live in houses rather than you know, uh, double story or block of flats. <coughs> not something important here. And the third case study is Havelock, where as you can see this is not a completed project. Uh, the community is just not now starting discussing the issue of, uh, of upgrading, but it's a very skilled community. A lot of people work in the local construction industry. They would very much like the approach of a double story uh, building, and the reason for that is that Mostly they rent sacks that they are just made from uh, materials that are byproducts or waste from the surrounding sites. Um, and then here you can see the fact that ownership is actually a barrier to upgrading because uh, you know it's, everybody sees this as a temporary settlement and it's, the renting it takes place and actually that does not provide the actual incentive for improving housing conditions. And on top of that, it, it's in a place where it's quite adjusted to formal housing with formal residents actually want to uh, clear the, the site out. And of course, this increases the, the challenges there. 
So, to quickly try to bring uh, what we've been trying to do in this project is first of all, with, uh, quite early on, we are, I had to accept that informal settlements are definitely not a problem. They are creatable and they are part of the cities and a part of urban form and we have to accept that. And it's not just provision of housing and it's about understanding the social processes and social fabric uh, behind that. Um, of course, active involvement, and sense of, active involvement is key to have a sense of ownership but unfortunately, this is something that is developed in the early planning stages. So if you don't involve people from the early planning stages actively, and how you do that is a very, very big question, uh, which, um, which we, uh, we don't have the answer yet. Uh, but without that, it is really, really difficult to talk about community-led upgrading. Uh, and of course, from a South African perspective, this is something that particularly collaborators from the Queen municipality have discussed it extensively, is that if you expect state funded housing and full package of services with title deeds and formal town planning and neighborhood development from the government, it's impossible. So, of course, community-led upgrading has have to happen somehow, and potentially the answer is through incremental citywide privacy-based participatory grading, which is something that the Hydro Resilient Cities Network have been trying to do, particularly in Devon, and this is how we've tried to uh, link our, our, our research, or in a way, have, because we, have, we found out that we have very similar objectives, uh, then from a policy perspective, us from a research perspective, so how can we drive the research forward so that we can provide recommendations at the end of this four-year project that involve they talk about community and upgrading, but from a citywide perspective, incremental, in the city, partnership based, participatory, uh, and of course, they have to be allowed. The, the difficult thing is about to allow the statutory and regulatory flexibility, the fact that you recognize informality somehow, and there is this flexibility to communities that show strong elements of self organization. And I would like to, to close this. Um, very brief presentation with our key questions because our ultimate uh, objective, overarching aim of this project is basically to produce a collaborative toolkit, we call it, but it's essentially a sense of recommendations for both local communities and also uh, the Tequin municipality of how they can integrate community-led upgrading more effectively into their existing models and practices. But we have a number of uh, questions quite uh, uh, evidently here. So if we talk about a collaborative platform, can it really be accessible to all uh, practically? Uh, and then, of course, who are the end users? Because if we talk about communities and municipalities, the final output should be translated into two very different languages and a set of skills and tools are very different uh, between the two. Uh, and of course, it's all about training and the provision of formal training for both. Uh, communities and municipalities, and uh, the key question of political stability, because we have made we make a lot of assumptions about how communities work, but then in an era of you know quite significant political challenges, it's quite difficult to actually propose something that tests stands the test of time. And with these questions, uh, we'll just leave it here, and hopefully we'll discuss that more later. Thank you very much.